Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast. Alex Moss here back with a new episode in our Darts Legend series. We've opened the floor to our listeners to get in touch with suggestions for players to chat to for this Darts Legend series and delighted to say we're joined by a three-time major finalist, one of the, the great characters, one of the, the best players really from the, the late 90s to early noughties. Here's our chat with Shane Burgess. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the three-time major finalist Shane Burgess. Thanks very much for joining us. Shane, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you very much. Yeah. We're starting all these episodes that we do on our Darts Legend series by going right back to the beginning with our guests. And for you, how did you first get into darts? How did I first get into darts? Well, um, uh, my dad used to play like for a team, local team, and uh, I, I then my, one of my best mates at school was darts fanatic. In fact, it was a bit unique, really, because my whole class at school all the boys and all the girls were absolutely darts mad at school and our form teacher was a math teacher and um, he used to let us stay behind after school and play everyone used to play darts it was it was amazing but I was rubbish then <laughs> absolutely rubbish but I absolutely loved it and um, I kept playing and playing and playing and eventually uh, what was it I started playing like um I wanted to take it seriously, so I started. I thought if I've got to get out of um, Hastings, not knocking the town, but you, you, I had to better myself darts wise, so that's what I ended up playing. Things like London Super League and stuff like that, and it all took off from there, really. And when we look back at your career, really, and when you broke through in the ranks in the BDO and the, and the PDC, I suppose it was during that contentious time, really, the, the early 90s, the, the split going on in darts. What are your memories of, of that? Well, yes, I was. I was um, my game was getting better. I was getting more confident. I was winning some opens. Um, I'd been um, picked for England a couple of times. Uh, yeah, and I was at the time I was actually world number for BDO world ranked number four. And um, I went to Canada, and it was at one of those joint ranked tournaments with uh, WDC as it was then, and the BDO. And I got talking to a good friend of mine, Graham Stoddart. And he said, you ought to join this lot we're in. He said, there ain't many of us, but the money's good. He said, uh, cause they used to say, uh, WDC stands for Wad, Wads, Dosh and Cash. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I'll have some of that, you know. So um, where do I sign? So a lot of people said at the time, it was, it, I mean, it was terrible at the time. Everyone was banned from everything. And you had to you had to be in that era to, to, to realise how bad it was, really. You used to walk into opens and they, they'd say, no, you're not playing here. And, oh, it was, it was terrible. It was a terrible time. But I've always been a bit of a maverick and I just said, where do I sign? And they said, you realise you're going to get chucked out of the Super League in England, you won't be able to play for England. And I went, no, no. But the truth was, I wanted to make a living out of the game. So th- th- that was where the money was. There was no living in the B. I couldn't see a living in the BDO. So um, I just joined... The, P, the WDC has became the PDC and um, and the darts really uh, took off. You, you, you mix it with uh, good players and you you, you, go, you either go one way or the other, you either crash and burn or you have to get better. And fortunately, I used to hold my own. Before we move on to your, yeah. your time in the, the PDC as it is now, I want to go back really to the heights of your, your BDO career to, to begin with and uh, a quarter final of the World Masters 1993 and then start of 94 is the, the first Lakeside since the split. You're one of the seeded players going to Lakeside. Um, what are your memories really of, of that time going to Lakeside for the first time and being a part of that? Yeah, well, I'd say, yeah. Um, well, I did, um, I must admit, I must admit, I always found that Lakeside so long. Um, I used to struggle up there and uh, I don't know why. I, don't, I think it, I think it was like a um, optical illusion. They used to have to do, you remember the if you see the old footage, they the, the board used to sink in, and they used to the chalkers like standing out, and it, it was like an optical illusion. It used to make me feel like it was long, and I used to struggle with it. And I got into the um, embassy world professional then, so it's, uh, it was number four in the world. And I really fancied my chances. All the big boys were out. They'd all they'd all gone and joined the WDC. And uh, I thought, well, someone's going to be crowned a new world champion here. Obviously, Bobby George thought, um, this is mine this year. And uh, ultimately, he lost in the final. But I, I crashed and burned in the first round. I lost to um, 
Ken teammate of mine, um, Steve McCullough, who they called Meatloaf. And um, he, played a, he played a really good game, really steady game. And I, I, just, I just struggled. And that was maybe part of my sign with the WDC. I thought, well, I don't really want to play on that stage because I, I don't really like it. And then, um, but yeah, yeah, I was having success in a few tournaments and, and uh, I was playing really well and uh, county and um, say for England and stuff like that. It was all going well, but ultimately there wasn't a living in. There just wasn't, a, I couldn't see a living in the BDO. So I just, just jumped shit really. Yeah, and just want to just touch on one more point, really, with that that week at Lakeside. What was your your one appearance in the embassy? And you mentioned there you crashed out in the first round. You were one of uh, seven of the eight seeds to, to go out in the first round. So it really was quite a a, a crazy week, really. All, all the the big seeds, if you like, falling early. Yeah, they were. I think I think I think everybody was sitting at home thinking someone's going to be world champion here. Everybody had in their mind that uh, all the big boys are out. Someone going to nick that world championship and um, yeah a lot of them just I think they just tried too hard so I I, I, I must I say I found the board long but I think a lot of them just tried too hard and they dropped like flies but the ultimate champion John Park deserved it um, he deserved everything he won he, uh, and obviously he won two more after that the man's a true champion so the true champion out of the uh, the 32 wannabes, really. It shone through in the end, and, um, and he showed his true metal in winning a PDC World Championship. He's, a, he's an absolute legend, he's John. Shortly after that, you make the switch to the WDC, and one of your first appearances on, on TV in, in that code is the World Match Play, the first ever World Match Play, 1994. How, how did it come about you getting in that tournament? Was there a, a qualifier to get into that one? No, no. Um, I mean, in those days, it was all a bit. Um, the, the WCDC needed needed players of uh, caliber to join them. And um, when I had a chat with them in in, in uh, Canada, and I said to them, "If I sign for you now, will I be in your next TV tournament?" Obviously, I wanted to be in their next TV. And they said, "The World Match Play is coming up." you've got enough points that even though you're not in our system if you join you can we can put your name on our system well, i suppose it was all a bit underhanded then you know hmm. they uh moved the goalposts a bit they said yes you're in air next um in the match play so with that was at um uh blackpool and what, what an absolute fabulous stage that is what a fabulous tournament and um i really took to it took to it like a duck to water beat bob anderson one of my idols um, in the quarters or the second round, something like that, and um, ultimately I just lost to um, the the, uh, the eventual winner, which was Larry Butler, and um, he, he beat Dennis Priestley in the final. And, and I spoke to Larry Butler about a couple of years ago. I was in America and we had a good chat with Larry, and he said, "I was." Uh, he said, "I'm not saying this because you're here, but you was the toughest game that I had." He said, if I, "He said, he said, if I knew I could get past you, I was going to win it." And um, he said, uh, I think he took out 125 on the ball when I was sitting on the double, and that was a real pivotal leg. And then they say he ended up beating me, but no, I thoroughly enjoyed my first tournament and um, went on from there. Yeah, and I mean, when you look back at that week in Blackpool, it was your, your first world match play, your first taste, really, of, of what life was going to be like in the WDC with the TV tournaments they were putting on and going up against the, the best players in the world as well. We mentioned Bob Anderson there, your idol, and the, the other players that were involved in, in that tournament as well. So how did it feel really being amongst the WDC lot and, and playing in these events? It was it was great. It was, um, it was great. I mean, it was... Well, you obviously you had all these rooms, all these um, idols, all these fantastic players who were, the, like the, I suppose, the, the cream that had gone, and you're rubbing shoulders with them, and then ultimately I ended up beating most of them most of the time. I'm thinking, I think uh, I'm actually getting good here. You know, these players, I'm actually standing toe to toe with these players and getting the upper hand on some of them. So, uh, yeah, the only well, I beat all of them. I beat all of them quite regularly really um, the only person I couldn't beat was Phil I just couldn't and it wasn't just me but uh, I just couldn't get the upper hand of him and he used to hit me like a ton of, ton of bricks and the off and he's very very he's a man the man's an absolute god on that part of all he's 
hardest player I've ever played to be. So intense, breathing down your neck, hitting you with big scores. Well, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't pleasurable playing field. Never. I'm sure, there's there's plenty of players out there listening, and players from your era that will say exactly the same. And I, I want to come back to that uh, rivalry that you had yeah. with Phil. But um, get towards the end of '94, and you make your debut in the WDC World Championship over at the Circus Tavern. And we talk about legends in the game. Your first game at the WDC World Championship against Eric Bristow. Yes, it was. Um, I think they played a round robin. Then they didn't play knockout. It was a three-man round robin. And I think it was me. Eric and Rod Harrington. Eric, I, I played Eric and I beat him quite convincingly, I think. I think more. I mean, I, I never played Eric at his best. Eric was already um, struggling when the when the WDC formed. He had a couple of good runs. I know he made the semi final one year, but Eric, Eric Watson, it was a shadow of his former brilliant self uh, through the 90s, really. And, um, yeah, I played him, and I say he never beat me. Eric, he never beat me any time I ever played him. But you say he was—he ne- wasn't the player. I mean, if he was, if I played him in his form, he probably would have not slowed me. But uh, yeah, he wasn't—he was a shadow of his former self. But I beat him quite convincingly. Then I lost to Rod. And um, if Eric would have beaten Rod, I could have gone through by a certain score. But. Uh, Eric said in the interview, don't worry, don't worry, Shane. He said, you're going home, you'll be digging holes in the road Monday morning. <laughs> it was, uh, he was a bit, he could be a bit abrupt when he wants to be. Well, it's uh, a few years later, then you make uh, another big run on, on the TV at the World Championship, the 98 World Championship. You make it through to the quarterfinals. You get through that group stage. Bob Anderson was in your, your group as well. And what was it like really at, at that time? Because we're coming into a spell now where, I don't know if you'll agree, it was you know some of your, your best starts really, a lot of great runs on, on the TV. What did it feel like getting to a quarterfinal of the World Championship? It was it was um, fantastic. It was... Um... The Circus Tavern was a great venue, and um, I just started. You just you have everybody has that like golden patch where they like two or three years where they where they absolutely feel invincible. And I that from from ninety seven up to two thousand, I was I was yeah I was getting more confident, and um, yeah I I I, I, I I didn't have a, uh, a doubt in the head against playing anybody in the world, obviously against Felix Phil. I mean, I tried not to, but Phil just used to, uh, he just used to get you every time. But anybody else I used to feel confident against. And it, uh, it was just, a, it was, they were good times. They were really, it was like a, I wouldn't say we were such a happy family. Some, some play was, you, know, you can't get on with everybody, but um, it, it was it was really good. It was a good time, it does, um, the late 90s. And um, it's a shame that, I've got a real chip on my shoulder about the 90s as it happens because um, the 90s seems to have disappeared from, you know, you go to YouTube and you go to any, any all um, stats and um, clips of film and they, they, a, a clip from the 90s is it's like, uh, well, it's like hen's teeth. You, you just don't find them. You, you come across, you obviously there's plenty of film in, but they just don't show a lot of darts in the 90s. And I don't know why that is. Yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, you were involved in, in plenty of great games and want to touch on as well, 1998, the, the WDC, the PDC then, it's um it's starting to build some momentum. There's more tournaments coming, a, a new one, the, the World Grand Prix in, in 1998 and uh, an unusual format really for TV with it being a, a double start. What was the mood like among the players when you found out there was going to be another tournament on TV, but you'd have to start with a double? Well, the, the PDC were, I mean, they were real trailblazers really because... Um, they had these tournaments. They, every, every tournament they had, they tried to play with a different format. You had the match play with the legs, then you had the world championship with sets. Then they had the double start tournament. Then they had one of those quad tournaments on the quadro board. And they also had a tournament that was equal darts. I don't know if you remember that one. It was a Green King tournament. I think they had it two years where, if, if you, you know, what equal darts is. So if someone goes out in 15 darts, and the, next, the person who throws second, if he can finish that leg in 15 darts, then they replay that leg. And uh, <laughs> that, that didn't last long. Yeah. Uh, imagine them doing it now. They'd be there all night. But, um, it was a real novelty at the time. And the quarter of board, it was fantastic, that was. But um, a lot of people played on the treble 20. They didn't really utilise all the quads, so I suppose that tournament died a bit, but yeah, the double start was unique, and um, I don't know, really, I just took it, I just, uh, 
I'm not not like an exceptionally brilliant doubles player, but um, I just it's all about confidence really and going going for the target. And uh, I got to the final. Um, there was a there was a um, a storm. The first one we played was in Ross Lair in Ireland, and it was in a tent, a tent in the car in the car park. This giant tent that held about two or three thousand people, and there was a storm outside. And it honestly thought that this tent was going to blow away. It was, it was that. But it honestly, it was that bad. And um, so I got to the final against Phil. Uh, didn't play the game again, and he gave me a good thrashing. And then the next year, that it moved to. Um, did it move to Dublin? No, no. Well, I'm getting wrong here. This is where I'm getting old. See, the <laughs> first one was in Rochester. That was it, in a place called the Casino Rooms in Rochester. Me and Phil in the final. And the second one was in a storm in Rochester. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting confused here, aren't I? Eh? Definitely want to come back to them uh, Grand Prix finals in a moment. But before those comes the, well, your best run in the World Championship, the 1999 World Championship. You get to the semi finals, and one uh, result that I've got to pick out straight away comes in the, the second round. You beat the top seed, Rod Harrington to get through to another quarter final at that point are you starting to think wow this could potentially be a, a, a life changing week for, for me yes uh, honestly I, th- I honestly thought this, this is what I've um, this this I'm going kind to of shine this week that's what I thought I uh, yeah I thought you know everybody builds up to that one event where they think in it and I say I'm, I'm playing really really well confident all the way and uh, I played um, Peter Manley in the semi-final and um, really, they should. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to blow my own trouble. Like, they should show that game on television. That was that was a fantastic game of darts. I mean, we didn't have hundred or averages, but the, the, the big finishes was. It was something I took out. Uh, one two one four ones or one six one. Something like a one three two or two one two twos. He had a one six one, a one four one, and oh, it was it was a fantastic game of darts, and it went to the leg before the tie break and um, I missed the ball for 130 out and Peter wanted 80 and um, he went double top double top which nobody you wouldn't do that in the <laughs> final well they do now it's like common, commonplace but Peter just went for it he went for it and it went in it went in and he got to the final so uh, it wasn't to be I never got that far again so uh Damn you, Peter Manley. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great player, great player. You were obviously to get a little bit of revenge on him the, the following year in the World Grand Prix, but before that comes the uh, the World Match Player that year. And again, we talked about this being some of your, your best years, really. The, the first couple of rounds, the 99 World Match Play, you dropped just two legs across the, the first two rounds. So over that format, he's... Is pretty impressive stuff, and the averages as well. Ninety-seven in the first round, hundred and two in in the second round. In in terms of performances on stage, would would you say that was the the best of your career? That was the best two games. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I had that hundred and two, I think there'd only been ever six players ever to have a hundred average on the television, and I was one of them. And um, that hundred and two, I was actually averaging a hundred and eleven with two legs to go. And I mucked it right up the last two legs and ended up 102. And I thought, you know, same again. I'm I'm on fire here. I'm on fire. I can throw him underarm. I played Dennis Priestley next round, who who I used to, you know, I'd win one, he'd win one, I'd win one, he'd win one. He was a very good player. He's a very nice, he's a gentleman, Dennis, but he's he's very slow. And um, I don't know, I just didn't get in the rhythm. And... um, yeah, he got he got the better of me in the quarters, and I was absolutely gutted because I thought the same again. I thought this pack was mine, this was mine. But uh, same again, the bride's maiden, not the bride. And at this point yeah. as well, you're starting to be among the the top seeds for these these big events as well. I think for that you were the fourth seed. We're coming to the the World Grand Prix that year as well. You're the fourth seed. Did did that change anything for you being one of the seeded players? And I suppose for people watching and the players as well themselves thinking wow this is someone I, I need to keep an eye out for now um well but, well I, I would know what the other players were uh, thought of me or no one ever really you know everybody had their own ego out the back there I suppose they still do now but uh um yeah I got up to number four number three whatever and, and 
yeah, I, I knew that um, I deserved to be there. I, I deserved the the ranking because I've been consistently for, performing in every tournament. Uh, yeah, I was just absolutely full of confidence, brimming with confidence. But the uh, the money still wasn't in the game. Though. It was earning obviously a lot better money than the BDO. Uh, I mean, they had a couple of big tournaments and what have you. But um, the money still wasn't there. We were, we were. I was paying the mortgage and um, living, but there, you couldn't. There was nothing for a rainy day, and there was a. You had to have a, a brewery contract or a, or a good sponsor or, or something like that, and I just didn't have. Just it just didn't come my way, unfortunately. And um, yeah, and that's even though I was having good results, playing well, full of confidence, it wasn't exactly in the bank up. So uh, yeah, ultimately, I. Uh, that's when you sort of, well, I don't know, really, I had to go and get a job in the end, and that's when my ranking suffered. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, you touched on the, the money side of things. Was there any point where you did take the darts full-time, or you, you did have a, a sponsor, that sort of thing, especially when you're making these big runs on TV and your, your name's out there? Um, yes, I, well, I was full-time for about six or seven years, but full-time with, I used to, honestly, on, on air, I used to do a bit of... Um, um, I used to work for my mate who was a, was a plasterer and um, used to do a few odd jobs here and there, keep myself busy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I was just saying, I was, we were winning enough to pay the bills, but nothing for, I think, you know, once I'm, I've got out of this game, no, it was so, I thought, what am I going to do? So I went and got my HGV licence and I was, it was a big, it was a bit of a bad move, really. I started driving a lorry and... Um, uh, you know, it affected me going really. I couldn't practice, couldn't put the hours in, and I started sliding down the rankings. And so we come on to your first of three TV finals that you make in the late nineties, early noughties. The the first of those, the the ninety nine World Grand Prix, and we mentioned two defeats that you had quite recently at that time to Peter Manley and Dennis Priestley. You avenged both of them. You beat Dennis Priestley in the quarterfinals. Then you beat Peter Manley in a in a last set in the semifinals. Uh, yeah. And also that other semi-final as well, just seeing Phil Taylor beating Rod Harrington 5-4 as well. Was yours the first semi-final or the, the second semi-final lap? I think mine was the first semi-final, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I left. I left the venue. I went. I, I won. And um, I went. So I didn't hang around to play, see the second one. And I didn't realise it had gone that close because, obviously, as first as, as great a player as uh, Rod is, uh, was, I I, uh, I would have fancied the chances more against him, really. But, uh, no, he wasn't to be. I mean, Phil Till was an absolute, well, it was an absolute powerhouse at every tournament. He just, I tried it all, double star or whatever they did, whatever they did, he was up to the challenge. I mean, he was an absolute genius, an absolute genius. Can't fault him, really. So what was it like then? Because obviously with the World Grand Prix, you, you play your semi-final, then it's uh, the, the final the following day, so you get a little bit of rest and a lot of time really to, to think about it. What was it like, the build-up to playing in your first TV final? Well, you you, you have a sleep this night, and um, obviously you think you're going to win, you think you're going to win, you know, itchy mart, itchy mart, get out there and itchy mart early on and get in front of him and stay there. Well, <laughs> obviously nothing ever goes to plan, but uh, yeah, you have a sleep this night and then, then they do some filming in the morning. They used to do, I don't know if they do it now, they do a bit of filming now, but they used to make us film together for a couple of hours. We had to go to a castle and do all this head-to-head filming and walk around the ground and stuff like that. And, it, you know, I hated it, absolutely. I thought, I want to do practicing now and getting the head right. And you're walking around the grounds of a castle in the freezing cold so they can get a, a publicity shot, you know. Fortunately, they don't do so much of it now. But, um, but it, that never affected Phil. It never affected Phil. We used to just get on with him. Yeah, I mean, he was a machine, a machine. Obviously, the, the final didn't go the way that you wanted, but what did you really take away from that week? Because it was a, another milestone for you getting through to that first big TV final. How much did you take away from that week going forward? Yeah, well, that's it. Well, as soon as you get there, you think, well, this is it. I can make finals. I can I can, I can beat anybody now. I can, all I've got to do is get past one man. No one uh, can... I know that no one can stand in my way now. So, um, yeah, and like I said, the, the next year... It was um, it was me and him in the final again, and uh, I beat Peter Manley six 0 in the uh, semi final that year. And um, I'm thinking I'm absolutely flying here. So of course you get to feel and uh, no, never, not again. And uh, the, the prize money wasn't 
and they were struggling at the time. The prize money actually was getting worse as you know uh, the court case drained a lot of the funds, and um, they were struggling for sponsors. And towards the late nineties, the, the, the prize money was actually going backwards. We all thought, is this going to last? So it wasn't fantastic anyway. But um, the the first well. Grand Prix in Rochester. I think I got four thousand eight hundred or something like that for losing in the final. And the second one, a year later in Ross, there I got three thousand two hundred or something for losing in the final. So it went down sixteen hundred quid. And um, that's when we all started. Well, I started questioning. You know, is, is this gonna is this gonna be sustainable? Like, you know, we're all, we're all sweating bullets here to try and get to these finals, and the prize money's going backwards. It was nobody's fault, but people in the background were trying really hard to uh, bring it on. But um, so eventually it got there. But uh, by that time, I dropped out of yeah. And so that, that second World Grand Prix final, the, the following year, 2000, and you, you touched on there that the win against Peter Manley in the semi-final, 6-0. I mean, when you get to the final and you see his fill again, it, is it kind of like that video game when you get to that last level and it's that, that boss and you just can't quite get over that, that last level? Was that what you were feeling, that sort of thing? A bit like that, yeah. A bit, because I'd say it wasn't the only time I've I mean, I've been playing field quite regularly. Yeah, we were playing you know, in, in America and Canada and not just the Chile. We were playing tournaments all over the place. And I just, I mean, I beat him once. I beat him in the East Ford Open. And uh, yeah, I lost in the final of that to uh, Bob Anderson that day. The same time I ever beat him, I just, he was just, he was just my doggy cow. I just couldn't. I got close to him a few times, real, real down to the double close. But um, on television, I just couldn't get near him. Just, just couldn't get near him. Just, uh, like I said, I wasn't the only one. A lot of, a lot of players never, never beat him. You know, and a lot of players had the, had the um, uh, luxury of him getting beat in the early rounds. So they play, didn't play Phil in the final. And then it was obviously the battle of two people, you know, um, had got a title and someone coming on top. So it was, you know, it's all about times and places, isn't it? And I, I was never in one of those tools where I got through and Phil got beat. Every time I got through, he was sitting there waiting for me in the final. <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh, well. So after that final, then the, the next couple of years, I suppose, it's, it's a, a little bit of a barren spell for you in terms of the, the big TV events. No real big runs on there. But 2003, the, the PDC introduced a, another new tournament. And again, it's another one that you take to really well to begin with, the, the UK Open. And what, what was your feeling like heading to the Reebok Stadium to play in that one? Because again, it's a, a new format, the random draw, the FA Cup style of things. How are you feeling heading into that one? Yeah, well, I'd, um, I used to have... Uh... Um, open events that are qualifying tournaments then like players it was all different then then players championships we have all these pubs where you had to win a certain amount of money anyway I uh, like I said then I was working then I was driving a lorry wasn't practicing my game was going backwards so I thought well my television days are over yeah so I went to a pub in I think it was Manchester and I ended up winning just about winning enough money to qualify for this uh, first UK Open so um, uh, I get there and uh, not confident at all. I thought, well, you know, I might win. I might win a couple of rounds. But and I'm practicing and I clicked on something. And uh, I know when I when I, I click and I thought, hang on, I'm playing well here. <laughs> I'm going to do well here. So I just said to my good friend um, Roland Shelton, I said, Roland, I said, uh, uh, heads are going to roll this weekend. I said, I found it. I found the game. And he called. He laughed at me. He said, he said, you know, you're rubbish now. He said, you're a... <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm going to have a run in this. I know when I'm playing well, I'm going to have a run. Anyway, he laughed. Anyway, we got to the uh, semi-final, and uh, he was in the semi-final along with me. There was me, Paul Williams, uh, Phil, and um, Roland. So it was at the back, and I said, I told you, Roland. I told you I was playing well, and Roland got beat by Phil. And so ultimately, I got beat by Phil in the top. But that was the best I ever played against him in that final. I played, uh, I was actually, like, we were sort of, you know, quite even for a, a few legs there. And then he uh, obviously pulled away and ended up winning it. But that was the best I ever played against him, I think, in any final. And when you look back at that tournament as well, I suppose the, the final day is from the, the quarterfinals to play to a finish. And 
I suppose nowadays, really, we don't get a, a long final like that. Best of 35 legs, you guys had to play for that final. But nowadays, it's the, the best of 21, a, a little bit of a shorter format. How, how did you feel when you get through those couple of rounds, quarterfinals, semifinals, and then you've got to go up again for a, a race to 18, quite a long format? It is, it is. And it, what it was, it was a hard, long, hard old day that was. The PDC, for the first um, couple of years for, in that, they, they did they tweaked it quite a bit and the legs went up and down and sideways in, in quite a few of the rounds but um, yeah that was a long old day and a long old final but you know when you're a certain age you can sort of soak that up but when you turn when you're in your mid 40s it starts getting hard work but uh, I was um, you know I was still in my late 30s then and um um, I would make Phil, Phil was a couple of years, I probably made Phil about 40, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, we were relatively young men in darts terms, and uh, it was a long old day, but a very enjoyable day. It was a fantastic venue, the pre box Stadium was brilliant, and it was a fantastic tournament, and it still is, you know, really good. And you were one of the great characters of that time. I mean, you look at that run at the UK Open, getting to the final, a 1-5-6 finish to win your semi-final, and then in the final as well. I know it didn't go your way, but a 170 finish in, in amongst that as well. And I think a, a year or so before that final at the World Match Play, you were losing to Phil Taylor, and uh, you had 50 left and decided to go for the, the bullseye first start. So you, you were quite one of the characters, and you are always fun to watch as well. <laughs> I did qualify for the match, but yeah, Wayne Marlow had just um, joined the PDC and he was meant to be one of the big stars. And we had a, I'd say him again, I'd, I'd slipped right out of it, had to play a qualifier. I think he was down in Swansea or Cardiff, something like that. Played the same again, played really well that day. Got fit uh, against uh, Wayne in the final and I batted him. I thought I batted him 6 0. <laughs> yes, anyway, out of the 32 in the match, who did I draw first round? Yeah. Bloody Phil again. Yeah, and he, I, I'm not, I wasn't ready. My game wasn't ready for it and he beat me 10 0. I, I was, I was awful. And um, uh, I remember saying to him on stage, he was nine mil up or something like that. And I said, uh, I said to him, this is when I make my comeback. <laughs> he looked at me like he was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not in your damn, I'm playing rubbish. And I said, oh, this is when I make my comeback. And he looked at me, daggers, absolute daggers. <laughs> and I think I left 50 and I just went for the bullseye. And uh, I think Eric Bristow at the time said, that's disgusting. <laughs> I said, but I'm not in your damn, does it matter? You know? Mm. You know, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I used to just, you know, there was times and places for playing around and I used to, yeah, a bit of a character, I suppose, at times, yeah. We come to the end of 2008, you're playing the, the World Championship qualifiers and after that you decide to leave the PDC. I know that a few years before that you weren't hitting the, the, the TV events as, as regular as you were before or getting on the, the big run. So at, at that point, what was the thinking behind the decision to, to walk away from the PDC? Well, it wasn't so much walking away. They were making it... Um, they were closing all the doors. They didn't have qualifiers for ring anymore. They didn't have. Um, uh, they were just shutting all the doors one by one, making it harder for for um, your, your average player or, or your, the people outside to get in. So I mean, now you've got Q school and that's it. You've got well, you've got the UK Open. You've got these a few qualifiers for that. Like you can win them. Um, but even they're not easy anymore. Do you get up to two fifty, three hundred people plus turning up for these qualifiers? So. Um, yeah, yeah. He, once you slipped out of here, they started shutting all the doors and, and they made it harder and harder and harder to get in. And um, so I just stopped sort of trying to knock on the door, really. I just, I not as if I gave it up. I just, it was just near enough impossible to get in. So I did have a brief, um, uh, what did I do? I won a tournament, I won the Isle of Sheppard Classic four or five years ago which qualified me for the World Masters, the BDO World Masters again. So uh, I went up to the playoffs and I won it. I won the playoffs and I got back on the um, television and I ended up playing uh, Jamie Hughes. And um, he ripped me a new one <laughs> <laughs> in the last 16. I always remember, he, he, um, I think I got £250 for that for the last 16 of the World Masters. And um, that took me £250, drove out the down the road was in Hull and my alternator went on my car so I had to get recovered back to the garage and they charged me £250 for a new alternator so <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make anything at all <laughs> so uh, today that's the last time I was on television 
Yeah, I mean, after 2008 and your, your chapter with the, the PDC, you, you mentioned there the, the World Masters 2014. A couple of years before that, you come through one of the Riley's qualifiers to play at the UK Open again, uh, just under 10 years after making the final. So there's been a, a few times where we've we've seen your name crop up and again. And a couple of years ago, of course, you went to Q School 2018, played a little bit of Challenge Tour as well. At, at this moment in time, though, where are you at with your darts? Are you still playing? I do, I, honestly, I do my work, my life backwards, I do. Uh, I've recently um, moved, because all my life I've lived in Hastings, which is the opposite end of where they play all the darts. And um, now that I'm playing probably, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on a bit now and I'm, I'm playing a bit up and down, I've actually moved to St Helens, which I actually live 20 minutes along the road from where they do the Q, Q school qualifiers. If I'd have done that 15 years ago, I might have got back in again. But, uh, yeah, so I I might have a couple of goes at the old uh, Q school. Actually, we moved to um, St Helens. I went to uh, the local dart shops and um, I said, uh, I'd like to join a Super League team, the yeah, Lancashire Super League. But I said, oh, yeah, just along the road there. Uh, that's, the, that's your local team in there. So I went in there. And there's um, Johnny Bowles, um, Gary Welding, Alan Tavern, Stephen Bunting, Michael Smith, <laughs> all played for the same Super League team. I thought, well, can I have a game? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I've been playing with that lot, and uh, it's really, really good. Really, I really enjoy it. So, um, yeah, it's a very, very different uh, level of darts up in Lancashire. It's um, very good, very hard. Uh, you never know, it might bring my game up again. Uh, say never, say never. I'm 56 now. But I'll be day, I can still hold my own. So, um, yeah, watch this space. Glad to hear. We, we should also touch on something that you did last year as well. You brought out your own book, Everybody Gets 15 Quid, The True Story of a Darts Champion. Talk us a little bit about that. A little bit about that, yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've, over the years, so I've had, I used to have... Um, there's two people that had camper vans to travel to the darts. Phil had a camper van, and so I went and got myself a camper van. No one else had one, just me and Phil. Uh, mine was a bit like lower key than his. Like, he had a big motor home thing, and I had a proper camper van. But I absolutely loved it. I used to take me uh, fishing rods with me, and you know, like, it's something always used to happen to me. It's something like always at a breakdown, or, or oh, well, well you, you need to read the book, really. So. Um, I thought, I've got to get this down before I forget part of this. And um, so, it was, you know, some of these unique stories, uh, nothing bad ever used to happen. I was just sort of get out of it, but something always used to happen. It still doesn't really happen. It still, it still does happen to me. I was, um, I actually broke down on the M25 last Friday in the fast lane. Didn't get the car over, so I was actually, actually sitting in the fast lane for an hour. I mean, <laughs> and that's more frightening than playing Bill Taylor, I tell you. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so I thought, oh, I've got to get me, I've got to get all my stuff down in a book before I forget it, because this, this is, honestly, I'm, I swear this is going to be good reading. And um, so uh, it took me about a, a year or so, I suppose. I found myself a, a ghost writer, and um, we got this book out. And uh, I've got 44 five-star reviews on Amazon. Everybody I know that's read it has absolutely loved it. So, yes, so, um, it's out there, and um, it's my sort of life story in darts, and uh, I'm quite proud of it, as it happens. It's quite good. Excellent, yeah, just having a, a look at the Amazon page here, and as you say, there's plenty of, of great reviews on there, and we'll, we'll leave a link to the to the book as well if any of our listeners want to check it out on when they listen to this interview as well but um just uh, a couple of questions that we're finishing up with with all our darts legends that we chat to and the, the first one is with regards to the the future of darts of course you've played the bdo you've played in the pdc but what do you see for the future in darts oh the future in darts the future in darts is uh, quite bleak as am it's like four well pdc obviously go from strength to strength but bdo wise i mean it's completely up in the air they're um like I think there's three different um, entities vying for the trade, the, 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 the county teams at the moment. I'm not quite sure how it all works, but they're going to be running super leagues and, and separate county leagues and stuff like that. But I, if they, I think, I 
genuinely think if they run it like it used to be run it, like uh, over a weekend, because people don't have that luxury time anymore. A lot of people work a six day week, or they haven't got the money, or, um, you know, beer and food and accommodation's too expensive now. County dance has got to reinvent itself, I think, because you just won't get the talent coming along. It just seems to be that anybody that's out on a jolly up that just wants to go to county, you haven't got those genuine players because they can't afford to go. So, um, yeah, I think, it, yeah, it's all good, but it needs to reinvent itself. And I think if they don't, then BDO sort of side of things is going to slip further and further down into the mire, whereas the PDC is just strength to strength. I mean, they're, they're going to be opening up in China and all that lot soon, and you know, it's going to be an absolute global phenomenon, I think. And the final question for you is, if you had to pick one favourite moment from your time in darts, what would it be? My favourite moment? Well, the best thing you can ever do in darts, the best feeling you can ever do in darts is when you're absolutely on top of your game and you walk into a venue and you walk in the doors and everybody looks around and you can see the look on their face, you're thinking, oh, no, what's he doing here? and you end up winning it, that is the best feeling you'll ever get in the world. But now, these days, I walk into a venue and they all look around and say, oh, well, this is another fiver in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that is a good feeling when you can walk into a venue and everybody turns around and thinks, oh, crazy, and you end up winning it. That's brilliant. That's the best feeling you've got. Well, Shane, it's an absolute pleasure to chat to you, talk about the career that you've had in the game, and glad to hear that you're still playing as well. So, wish you all the best for the future, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again to Shane for joining us. And as we said towards the end of that chat, if you want to go and check out Shane's book that he brought out last year, Everybody Gets 15 Quid The True Story of a Darts Champion, it's available on Amazon and a few other places online as well. So, go and check it out if you fancy having a read of that. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode in our Darts Legends series, so keep an eye out for that. Myself and Burton DeWitt, we're going to be hopefully going to try and bring out a uh, regular episode of the podcast in between the, the break, if you like, of the, the Premier League restart. Of course, the Premier League starting up again on Tuesday tomorrow. If you listen to this on the day release, going from Tuesday to Sunday, and then uh, starting up again on uh, Wednesday, I believe, the, the following week. So we'll try and bring a, an episode out for you guys uh, in the middle of that. Of course, don't forget to take part in our Premier League Prediction League. We're carrying on from the the first six weeks. Of course, the, the prize the winner is a signed set of Michael Van Gogh and Darts, courtesy of Windmill. So go to our Twitter, at Weekly Dartscast, to uh, get your picks in. Free to enter. That's all the time we've got for you on this episode. We'll be back on Thursday. But until then, hang tight.